because your inner and outer self image can greatly impact your confidence, credibility, and reputation, I want to draw clear lines that bring these points together. Research has shown that people tend to make judgments about others based on their appearance within seconds of meeting them. This means that the way someone looks can have a significant impact on how they are perceived by others, which can in turn affect their success in both personal and professional settings. So what I'm saying is that individuals, you can use your appearance to project confidence and credibility. I want to share personal stories of some clients whose identities will be protected. These are some personal stories. Here's a story about a client who did not feel, and this is not a business story, this is truly a personal story. There's a woman I worked with who did not feel really very good about herself. She had some significant issues with weight and eating problems and so on. She got herself down to a size zero and still didn't feel great about herself. It's like having a form of body dysmorphia. And there were a lot of other issues going on, all of which were not even physical. They were about the mindset. And so we worked together for some period of time. And within a few months, she decided that she was ready to go out on a date if she could find a guy that she would want to go out on a date with. And she went and they, she looked fabulous, of course. And, and, and she actually felt really good about herself. In her case, she had had so much counseling and therapy and everything. But the thing that was really missing for her was an ability to see the impact of all of that work that she had done internally. So by the time we got working together, we were discussing that journey and I was able to help bring her look more up to date with where she was in her mind and heart and soul and spirit. So she really looked more like herself, this part of self that isn't usually visible. Well, things were moving along in this relationship and they were, let's just say they were on, on the pathway towards engagement. And she contacted me one evening and said, my, my guy wants to take me to the Ritz Carlton in Half Moon Bay for the weekend. And he wants to be intimate with me. And she was super scared and nervous about this because what she revealed to me was that this was a moment where she did not really feel safe and she really wanted to. So yours truly played a role in helping her feel that way by getting her her lingerie trousseau, where it was filled with layers and her favorite colors and things that, that genuinely made her feel confident. That's the point of this. She felt a kind of confidence in herself that she could be present in her time with her guy. And afterwards, she had to tell me all about it, which is hysterical, of course, but it was so lovely. And I was so happy for her and him because they were really becoming a union. Soon after, of course, they were formally engaged and they got married. And all because she learned to see a kind of confidence that she actually had within herself, but needed and deserved to see the outer reflection of the inner self. One little PS to this story before we move on to a story about credibility is that my client and her now husband, who also became a client, 
asked me to officiate at their wedding, which I did with great honor. So that was a very fun experience and a great story that highlights what confidence can do in your appearance and the power that clothing can have. So let's talk about credibility next. Here's an example of a situation with an expert witness that I worked with. This was a trial, a corporate trial, and there was something called a tech tutorial. A tech tutorial is something that happens when uh, a judge does not understand the technology that is up for discussion and is germane to a case. So the judge can order a tech tutorial. It's not meant to be an adversarial proceeding. It's meant to be pretty friendly. And yet both sides of the case are entitled to bring forward their expert witnesses to talk about the technology from each of their points of view. So I was brought in to work with this particular expert witness and also to prepare all the attorneys who would be seated at a counsel table on this particular side of the case. He appeared for the expert witness that is, appeared for the first tech tutorial, but before he and I got to work together. And it became very clear that he needed some help. The reason that my client, the corporate client, had engaged this expert witness is because he is brilliant. He has all the knowledge necessary to help tell a story and, and prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they had something special about this technology. And I can't get into all the details of this case. It's probably don't want to hear it either. But the point is that what he did was he just barely got over the finish line at the first tech tutorial. And what he needed to really do is bring it at the second one. There wasn't anything that he needed to do differently in terms of his preparation from a knowledge and expertise standpoint, you have to understand. But the fact that he was flailing at the first tech tutorial impacted his credibility. There was a call of a challenge for his expertise and authority at that tech tutorial because he wasn't bringing it. And the opposing expert witness and he, by the way, both went to college together and the expert witness that I worked with revered the other guy and thought, well, he's always really been out there and doing his thing. So we really had some work to do and we did everything. In the end, he showed up really knowing himself from a self-image perspective where we did a deeper dive study on who he is and what elements of self he could really bring to bear. And yes, he was attired correctly that helped to support what those messages were that he needed to bring to himself, that if he could show up first and foremost, just for him, he would really deliver for the client. And he did. So we went from a case that was not looking so good pre-trial at a tech tutorial to everybody waking up and taking note of the powerful testimony that this expert witness gave in the second tech tutorial, which began to spin the wheels in favor of my corporate client. The PS to the story is it went so well that the corporate client ended up not having to actually sit through what was planned to be a two-week trial and arranged with an amicable settlement with the opposition that was an eight-figure settlement in my client's favor with some sort of a licensing agreement in perpetuity. So I would say that how you show up is, again, an example of 
how you can bring credibility. And let's also say that the expert witness, in addition to boosting his credibility, also felt a kind of confidence. Give me a heart or a thumbs up if you're enjoying these stories and if you're learning something about the connection between your appearance and your image. Cool. I'm glad that I'm getting through on the point. Now we have the third topic that I want to talk about, which is reputation. And here's an example of that with another client. Last summer, I worked with a gentleman who is a C-suite tech executive in the Silicon Valley area. <clears throat> he received an imperative from the co-CEOs of the company that they wanted him to become a driver of the business. And what happened was he and I worked together and we talked about where he was headed in his mindset on things and how to bring about more of himself from the perspective of a driver. What this meant is that he needed to bring forth things about himself that he did not really know how to bring forth without a little bit of guidance. And so this ended up being a, a wonderful project for him. Not only did he show up, but he immediately began to turn on these elements of self that he needed to bring. And he was delivering and his team saw that he was shifting and, and everybody was rising to the occasion and it was fantastic. At some point while we were in our consultation phase with each other, I said to him, you know, something tells me that it's very possible that these people are looking to hand over the keys to the car. Are you thinking at all that maybe they want to do that and they are grooming you to take over running the day-to-day -day operations of this company? And he scratched his head and said, honestly, I would never have even thought about that. Maybe I'm just too close to the situation. Well, we talked about it some more and he went to work and took action. The other thing that was happening is because he's very well known and re well respected and regarded in the tech community, lots of different CEOs of different companies, several came to him throughout the course of the next several months, taught wanting to talk to him about business problems that they were having. And he was armed with this healthy mindset about being a driver. And he was also showing up, bringing the look of what a driver would wear, a driver of his sort, of his particular qualities, traits, and characteristics, what, what, what he needed to bring to bear about himself as a driver. If you need to be a driver, what you need to wear will be unique and special and different to you. So he kept having these meetings and the next thing you knew, <laughs> the next thing he knew, he was getting job offers that he was not looking for and turned down all, but finally he couldn't say no to the, at the fifth time. And now he became president of another company where he is a driver and he called me up the very next day and said, it was really our conversations and you getting me ready with my look that basically put everything into action to make everything happen. Now, I don't really take so much credit for this because the man had to show up and do his work and he had to be the giving person that he was that put him in proximity to all these various opportunities where he could serve and be of help. And in the end, the right opportunity arose where he looked and was with his mind and with his physicality ready to take on the role of president of a company in charge of growth, which is in itself a driver. So if you can imagine if you could put yourself in the position of any of these three people whose stories I just shared, 
if you could imagine yourself in any of those positions and think about the pitfalls of what would have happened in any case if they or you could neglect your appearance, it's not a vain or vapid thing. I don't know if my female client whose story I first shared would have actually gone on to get married. I don't know if the expert witnesses testimony would have come out so strong in the second tech tutorial and that it would have turned into that eight figure result for the company that engaged him and me. I don't know that my client who became president of growth for a major company that everyone knows the name of the company, which is why I can't tell you it. it I can't say that any of these situations would have turned out the way they did. And I think that this is a very powerful thing to, to think about. We also should talk briefly about technology's role in how we think about appearance these days. We have online meetings. This is also an online meeting. And even though this is an audio only event, I can tell you right now that I got dressed up because I wanted to be more fully present for you because it's my responsibility to deliver value. And if I were to sit around and have this conversation in shorts and a t-shirt, or quite frankly, if I was wearing less than that, because you can't see me, that might seem like a very nice and comfortable thing to do, but really shows you as the guests of, of this morning, no deference. So I'm in a jacket and a shirt and pants and socks and shoes all done up because this is how I know that I get to bring more of myself to bear. And this is factually true for everybody. So online meetings, whether they are in audio format like this or video format where you can actually see somebody, it, it still matters how you show up. And even the background of your Zoom meeting or if you're on a WebEx matters. If you look like you're covering up a background because you've got laundry piled up, move the laundry and show your full background. Keep something nice and clean. Because if you don't, it actually shows to people that you're messy. And that's not really a person trying to be judgmental, but people are passing these kind of creating these evaluations in their eyes and then in their minds because they, they see something. Also, when it comes to social media for professional networking, the picture that you put up on LinkedIn, or if you're going to do posts where you post up photos of yourself or where you're doing videos, whether they're live or recorded, how you look absolutely matters. It's, it's certainly possible to be authentic and raw and real and still look polished and professional because that's how you really want to show up for your, you know, for your clients. If you don't look client ready, that's, that could be an issue. If, if you are, let's just say that you're a person who serves lawyers and, and, and executives, maybe you're their accountant, let's say, or a banker. If, if you show up to, to meet with somebody and, you know, your client is actually looking like they just came back from playing pickleball, well, that's kind of up to them because they're the client. If you don't show any kind of deference and you look like you should have been playing with them, but you weren't invited, <laughs> I actually think that it makes you appear that you're, you're trying to be more at their level. And instead, if you have a fiduciary responsibility to someone, then you really do have to show up like you are the responsible party. So self-image is about your inner and outer elements. And I hope that I've been able to make that point pretty clear in a short amount of time today. It's easy to think that image is all about the surface 
because images are almost always of exterior or surface of a person or an object. But what if you could x-ray your inner self-image and see a snapshot that resembles a personalized constellation like your own stars in the sky? I use a self-evaluation tool with clients that measure 15 aspects of self-image. And this snapshot helps you see where your self-image is strong and where you have growth opportunities. So imagine if your constellation is not fixed in the sky and that you could move around some of the stars so that your constellation resembles a flower in full bloom. Can you envision that? Focusing on your growth opportunities helps you move those stars and your constellation of strengths so that you can attain that full bloom. Taking this x-ray snapshot of your self-image provides direction for who you are and how you can reach your full potential. So this snapshot offers a, a science and psychology backed precise methodology to help you plot your growth trajectory. I think that's super cool. It takes about 15 minutes to complete and you and I will get a session together afterwards to review the stars that make up your self-image constellation. I'm happy to answer some questions and perhaps get a little bit specific if, if I can help you in some way. Shanae? Hey, Joseph. Hey. I guess, Joseph, like in your process, and I'm genuinely curious, how do you, how do you style and up-level someone's image without sacrificing their authenticity, like without them feeling like they're going to be stuck in this stuffy suit or something like that? That's a great question, and thanks for asking. You have to be true to yourself. That's the premise of my type of image consulting. This isn't at all about making you be a person that you aren't, but there is a fine line between being a person who you aren't and being a person who shows potential. I work with high potential people and they are also very interested in growing. So people who are interested in growth tend to resist shifting as a result. So a great example of this would be one time, I, I have a billion stories like this, but I have some highlights that I love to share. I once had a, a guy come to me who said, Joseph, I can dress exactly like this. And he was wearing what I call mom jeans and a Nike Wickaway t-shirt and sneakers that looked like he had just come from a muddy run. And he's an engineer and a manager level at Google. And I said, okay, well, we're you know, I'm going to profile your style so I can understand your personality, qualities, traits, and characteristics and figure out how you want to grow. And I'm going to profile your colors so I can see your energy and help you figure out the best way to really put yourself out there. I'm not going to put you in suits because that's really wrong for your job. That's not what the point of, of our working together is. And he felt such a sigh of relief. I think, you know, the idea of working with an image consultant sometimes can be, oh, the, you know, I'm going to make them look really formal. And so in this case, I put him in the best jeans and sneakers and t-shirts you can imagine that were on point for who he is. It wasn't about changing his level of attire, but we up-leveled the qualities of it and made it more pure to who he is and and helped him actually reach more of his potential there's a funny P ps i love the ps's to all these stories because they're all they're they're where the gems can be found so lots of people who work at google are also very highly driven by the company to go and do other things 
They want you to spend 80% of your working time working for the company initiatives and 20% doing something else. So this guy also wanted to be an actor and he was attending acting school and all kinds of stuff and trying out for parts, auditioning. So it was close to holiday time that year. And he said, I have to go to a holiday party and it's going to be with all the actors and my acting coaches putting it on and so on. Well, I said to him, I know that you and I already had this discussion about no suits. I said, but you know, this is a moment where he said, I know I need a suit. And I said, yes, you do. And we had a really good ha ha about it. And I went out and got him something amazing. And I also told him to just sort of watch his weight over the next few weeks because he's an actor and he wanted to try to flatten his tummy a little bit. And I said, look, the goal of all of this is so that you look magnetic in front of people. So the PPS of the story is that I was away for my holiday winter trip in Europe and he called me up late that night, which was very early the next morning for me. And he said, I know you're away and I know it's really, really not the right time to call. He said, but I had to call. I said, what's up? He said, you know how you told me that my objective was to look magnetic. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I, of course, I 100% felt great. I felt magnetic. You know, I, you knew that when, when I got fitted for the suit because you were there. I said, yeah, that's amazing. I'm so glad that you felt so great. And he said, well, what's even more incredible is three people came up to me and told me that I looked magnetic. They literally used the word to describe me that I was going for. And I said, and so, <laughs> so the point is that when you set an objective and you're mindful about how you want to put yourself together and put yourself out there, this is an internal game as much as it is an external game. So Shanae, I hope that answers a question with a really good example and how that works is per person, there's a unique individual answer that is special just for you. It does, Joseph. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. Anyone else have a question that you'd like to come up and ask? Oh, Joy. Hello, Joseph. Hi, what a joy to have you. <laughs> Lucky for some, hey. But Joseph, I love this whole thing about dress and having stylists and, and obviously being a woman, I've grown up you know, just, just being stuck in fashion. I think it's a female thing, but it's now a, men, a, a man's world as well. And it's good to hear what you do. But what I was wondering was, for, for me, clothes make me feel good. The right clothes make me feel good. So I hear that you were saying about that other gentlemen, people where I you know, found him magnetic. But I think there's an inner thing that it does for me too, which I, I don't know if you mentioned, I joined a bit late. But do you talk about the psychology around that? The psychology around style is always part of every conversation. And so, Joy, let me add something to this discussion since you bring it up. There is a theory that is known as enclosed cognition. I did not create this. There were a couple of people who were looking to get their PhDs and did a study about this. By the time the study about this came out in 2012, I had already been working for, get this, 23 years in my field and had a huge amount of clients over the years where I had been doing essentially case studies on every single client over the years. And what I can tell you is that when you wear something that makes you feel good, or if you want to feel better, like say you wake up and you're just in a foul or a funky mood and you know that you cannot really bring that into your day or that if you have something that's actually going on that you need to deal with, you might have to wall that off. But how do you do that environmentally when you're bringing all of that stuff with you in your brain? The first thing that you do in the day by 
going to your closet and getting dressed for the business part of your day, like after the gym or whatever, what you put on is consequential. It can absolutely affect your cognitive ability. That's why I don't know if you were here yet when I spoke about how I am all dressed up. I brought myself not only for a, a point of deference to you as my guests, but also it helps me stay focused. It's part of my cognitive ability. We tend to think that cognitive ability is this internal thing, like cognition is just about the brain. And I am sure because I've been with lived experience and the experiences of clients over decades of working with them now, where people tell me, oh, I really brought it. So when you think about going back to the points about confidence and credibility and reputation, those might be outcomes or, or things that you want to see come from how you show up at any experience. And yet, whether it's the, the client that I shared about, any of the three clients whose stories I shared, and then the fourth one that I ex shared about to answer Shanae's question, I think that in any of these cases, what they wore certainly help them to feel good or better about themselves. And even more than that, they, they could feel and see more of their own power. You see, if you, if you get an, an image of yourself and it might only be a snapshot image in the mirror, the, the real mirror, when you get dressed and you're not a narcissist, so you're probably not running around with a mirror all the time looking at yourself. If you can go like look in a mirror before you leave your house and you say, I, all right, I got it going on. And, and then you leave, you have that image of self and you immediately conjure up a feeling with that image that makes you feel at one with the way you feel and the way you are, the way you see yourself. When all of these things are positive and you take actions throughout your day, you've basically given yourself this unbelievable infusion of the drug of positivity. I, I even think that it's way beyond dopamine. I think what we're really talking about is you're giving yourself a chance to have a look that you can come back to and rely on. And it's an environment joy. What it, if the environment of your body, which is like a temple in my, this is part of my practice. If your body is a temple inside of which you create all of the energy to do the work that you need to do and where your brain resides, where it does all the thinking work that it needs to do. When you can do all of that work from within your body temple and you adorn the temple in the right things that help to emanate all of the energy, it's like you're using your body temple and your adornments like antenna that draw people to you and let your energy out and go dee, 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 and hit other people from within. And that's the power of what, what image making can do. And when you hear about people in the news that are kind of failing on their image making, like Sam Bankman Freed was, you know, in the news and Elizabeth Holmes. It's not just that they have allegedly done some pretty terrible things or have, you know, been convicted of such things in the case of Elizabeth Holmes from a business perspective, you know, how you show up really does make people further form opinions and you need not be in a court of law to have people evaluating evaluating how you show up. So I hope that gives you some food for thought, Joy. That was pretty, pretty beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> and I loved it. And it ties in with my own beliefs around how we think and how we feel and what we do. They do work together, but there also seems to be a, a magnification of something which you, as you said, the body temple and how we feel inside and how people see that on the outside. There is some other energy that's happening way beyond what we understand but we feel it. Totally. We feel it. 
so Amazing. and 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 that's your that's your gift you would give me that gift so thank you i appreciate that my pleasure and joy just before you go back i want to say that the flip side of this joy which we should talk about because it's one of the risks if you create cognitive dissonance through your appearance that let's say that you are bringing it internally and nobody sees it like if you go back to the story that i was sharing about the expert witness he had it all going on inside but he wasn't letting anybody see it and it was impacting his credibility and then it was impacting the credibility of the case so if you are if you might ever find yourself in the position that that could be happening you are doing yourself a disservice you're doing your clients a disservice when you're representing them you're rep misrepresenting your company and its initiatives if you don't show up it's important to eliminate that cognitive dissonance so i just wanted to bring that up because you know lots of people are very well skilled and and are right for the job right for the moment but then fail to really deliver. And this is why people fail. The greatest thing about failure is that a person could learn. But this is one of these issues where people think, oh, all I had to do is get dressed. Yes, but if you would put some thought and intention into it, it could drive the outcome that you're looking for. Because not only are you prepared in all your skills and professionalism, now you're really bringing it to bear and you're letting people see that you are thoughtful and prepared or nimble or whatever qualities need to be present in that moment. So Joy, thank you so much. Yeah, that's excellent. There's a big science to it, Joseph. I never really thought about it in that way. So I'll look into it some more, but I appreciate everything that you said. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks for coming up and being here. Jack. Welcome to the stage. Joseph, Here. hello. Hi. For having me up, really enjoying this audio room and can use someone like you in my life. So here's the thing. I'm a lawyer in New York. I have historically been sort of a clothes horse. You know, someone from the beginning of my career, I was a public defender in the Bronx back in the 80s and the 90s, and I was on trial a lot. And it was important to me back then to have a certain appearance. All of my suits were always custom. My body was such I really couldn't shop off the rack anyway. I used to go for, I loved the 1940s looks. You know, I loved four pleats and two inch, you know, cuffs at the bottom. And I, I had, I wore vests that had lapels. You know, I really sort of, and, I, and again, it was my style. I'm a big shoe fan. I had many pair of expensive shoes. And I guess really what the question sort of becomes now as things have morphed into what they've become post pandemic, I am not in court. None of us are real. I mean, I am not in court very much anymore. It's fairly infrequent. Everything is on zoom. Everything is, you know, it just doesn't happen. And certainly not as it was when I was a criminal defense lawyer, public defender. So I'm sitting here and I still dress. I thought I was quite fashion forward today and felt good that I was wearing one of my suits, but with, you know, a long sleeve black shirt that was not a dress shirt and felt really good. And, but I end up sort of defaulting to why am I putting on $600 shoes and kind of matching socks to sit here? I might as well just wear my Crocs now. <laughs> I, and I feel stupid in it. And it's kind of like, but who cares? Who's looking? We all live in the matrix now. You know, like it's like what people joke about. You could just put on a jacket or a shirt and not worry about, you know, what you have on on the bottom. But of course, it does matter psychologically. I guess what I'm what I'm asking is, I'm 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 in the I'm in the market for kind of a new image myself, or at least an enhancement of it, because I haven't bought clothes now in half a dozen years, and you know, and I'm older and I'm heavier and I have less hair than when I was rocking these clothes now. So the question becomes, is it still important? I suppose really what the question is, most of us lawyers that do what most of us do are really not even seen most of the time and you really wouldn't even have to care about it. But I feel better 
dressed up. I dress up to go to the doctor's office because I mean I just because I don't I I've always had the dress clothing and then I really didn't have much of a wardrobe other than like jeans and my you know hot tuna t-shirt from 1977. <laughs> I don't really, and and I know that when I go to a doctor's office or even a supermarket, you're treated better when you're dressed up and people, you know, look at you like you're commanding a certain amount of respect. And I appreciate that. But I I suppose it's a bit, speaking of cognitive dissonance, there's a bit of that on my day to day when I dress up. Sometimes I'm only dressing up for the half an hour I'm going to be seen. I'm I'm, I'm going to be with you and Shanae, you know, on our, in our group. Often, I'm not really seen by anybody, but when I take my dog out for a walk. So the question is, am I wasting dry cleaning bills, dressing up every day when no one really sees me? And is there a change that you would recommend for a lawyer of a certain age who's no longer rocking it out every day and picking juries? Oh, I love this. Thank you for sharing all of the context, because do you see everybody how Jack really was very open to share a lot of of rich insights about himself to kind of paint a picture for all of us to understand what he's thinking about. So bravo, Jack, for that. That's brave in a way and, and rich. My answer is actually very simple. You are exhibiting something truly important for every human being, and it's called self-respect. This isn't about how much money you can spend on shoes or clothes or whether your socks are matching and all of that. What this is really all about is it's about this very simple and finite thing called self-respect. In order for you to be of service and to give at the level that you know yourself to be at and that your clients are coming to you for, you have to pay yourself first. And the way you pay yourself is that you're making these investments with your wardrobe to a degree, with the time that it takes you to put something together, to contemplate what you feel like wearing that day, how that helps bring to bear more of the energy that you want to bring with you. All of that is about self-respect. Not to pivot away from you, Jack, but I want to share something with you. It's another story that I think will help to illustrate to you something about you that I see in other people that are just like you. I have a a client, happens to be a female. She is retired and she's in her 80s, so she's way advanced over you, and Her husband has dementia. She doesn't get to go out often, but she certainly, whether she leaves the house or she's staying in, she has a very high degree of self-respect. She loves designer clothes. It makes, they make her feel good. She's not trying to show off or impress anybody. She does want to look good when she's with her husband so that he still remembers her, what he's capable of, what his mind is capable of. And money isn't really the object of the conversation. She just likes what she likes and she can have it. Now, she gets dressed every day to go and dote on her husband, whom she loves with her whole heart and soul. And one day I was over at her house and we were talking about this because her husband's dementia was advancing at breakneck speed. And I looked at her and I said, you know, I think I really understand why we're doing what we're doing. And she said, well, isn't this so much fun? And I said, well, yes, of course it is, but it's more than that. What's really happening is you are investing in loving yourself so that you can give all of that love away to your husband, that if you aren't taking care of self first, you aren't really capable of bringing it that in a way that you really need to. And she started to cry and we sat together and she said, 
you know, these are really happy tears. She said, I knew that, but I never really put it together that way. And she said, this really makes me feel much more whole and complete, which in and of itself is the definition of integrity. So Jack, self-respect is about being in your integrity and what you are doing is living in your integrity. If you put on your clothes and your shoes and you're not in the Crocs, you're showing up in integrity and with self-respect. And as it pertains to, you know, how you create a more modern version of you, if you haven't bought any clothing in six years and you're wearing clothing that is, you know, at least six years old and some that is even older than that, it's not that it's all bad stuff. What is important is to create a new baseline of who you be, as I like to jokingly put it, who you be today, because who you are today is not the same human that you were six years ago or 12 years ago. It's not that you're not the same. There's more of you today than there was before. And so what's important is to refine and build upon the successes that you have had and how do you carry forward in a way that is also in keeping with the times of today, the technology of today, the way the courts are meeting today, at least in your jurisdiction, they're still doing it on Zooms. In other jurisdictions around the country, I know for a fact that they have quit that stuff and they're only doing in person. So when you know what you what's going to be visible, but you also know that 100% of you is visible to you. And right now, like I was sharing before, I am not visible to you, but I'm still bringing it. You know, that's how I can maintain this kind of focus and weave stories together and make points and tell you all these different things is because I'm really not, I'm, I know what I'm bringing today. And I know that how I am attired sitting at my table, looking at everyone's bubbles in the room so I can make contact with you to, to, uh, to some degree. This is how I know that I can that, that I can be there for you. And that's exactly the way that you would be there for representing your clients mm -hmm. and fighting for them. That's very insightful and moving, Joseph, and I appreciate it. And may I ask a just quick follow-up? Just for yes. anybody waiting. Just so the question, you talked about more of me, and I assume that wasn't a reference to, you know, my weight. But <laughs> no. more of me, but in terms of evolution, do you say to people, and I was just a case in point, because I thought when you said times have changed and if I haven't had, I have suits, I say to clients, I have suits older than they are. And many of them are classic and they were, you know, they're well <laughs> constructed. So I don't know that, you know, I mean, perhaps two inch cuffs, but, but I don't know that they go out of style. What happened to me is I wore an earring since I was a young man and it was very important to me in my image. It was who I was. It was originally kind of, it was political initially. And then it just became all parts. I gauge the earring. It got bigger and it was just part of my look, but it was important to me. I tried many cases that way. Then I got older and older and grayer and people would say to me, including my law partner, dude, you look like a schmuck actually. You look like you're trying to look young. It's stupid. And it really kind of came down to after a while, it was like, really, maybe you can, you outgrow these things, right? So that's a question. Do you tell clients, you know what, dude, you know, like you can't wear your hair in a ponytail anymore you're bald and you're 60, or you really should lose the earring? Or is that something that one just goes with one's own, you know what, the heck with it. This is how I feel integrated. This is how I feel, you know, integrated. And yeah, proper. so I love to study those things about people because understanding some of the context and the history of how you have developed a look helps to tell us more about why it was relevant and to question and not assume that it's still relevant in a way that in discussing these types of matters, when if we were to deem together mm -hmm. that 
yes, this really does make a lot of sense that you should maintain that look and feel about yourself, that image of yourself. That's important for kind of rededicating yourself to the look. In a way, you know, you're probably not the only attorney to male attorney to wear an earring in an ear, you know, in court. It, it's probably not common, but it's but you're certainly not going to be the only one. It can create a look about you that is iconic, especially among people who know you. I would describe that as a bit of a, a signature style item. Now, recently, and I was quoted in the New York Times about this a couple of weeks back, about Jensen Wang, who's the CEO of and co-founder of NVIDIA. He's really famous for wearing leather jackets and has a collection of them. Well, you may be famous within your own circle of that's how you show up. Now, the question is, if you maintain that, does it hold you back from moving forward or does it typecast you in a certain way, which is why it's important to discuss those types of things in the context of does it help to reveal a quality trait or characteristic about you that you even identify with having today or a person who you still want to become that maybe you have always been, but you know, maybe you need to bring more of those powers to bear. So that's the type of thing that I like to study and help you, you know, help you understand why does it even, why is it even relevant anymore? It's not to question whether it is, but if it is, and it has been, why it, why it could continue to be. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another quickie example. I, I have to use sometimes famous people because they're people that we can all see and identify with. Mark Zuckerberg. The media asked me, you know, outright many times at the time that Facebook was about to go public, hey, shouldn't Zuckerberg show up in New York courting investors wearing suits? Da, 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 da. And I said, well, you know, quite frankly, that would have been the time to have him make some sort of a pivot in his appearance because that was the time that the company was also growing up. Therefore, he could also show that he was maturing. Well, he sort of, you know, dropped the hoodie concept more or less and moved into really fitted t-shirts custom made by Brunello Cuccinelli, no less. So not just your ordinary tee. And yet he never really moved into more of a look for himself other than this. And I know that he doesn't really want to think about what he's wearing because he feels like he has more important decisions to make, which sounds very Steve Jobsian, if you know his story about his Isemiyaki mock turtleneck t-shirts. Point of all this is now when Facebook became meta and there were these other opportunities to potentially create a shift. Now Zuckerberg is really pigeonholed and cannot change because you know what's going to happen? The moment that he makes a big change like that, it means that people are going to start questioning the fundamentals of his actual business, which there may or may not even be a through line to. But people will be very curious and they will start looking under the hood of Facebook slash Meta and all of the ancillary, you know, related businesses that are part of the Meta verse, if you will, mm -hmm. the Meta company. So, okay, you're not Zuckerberg, but you're still Jack Tuckner. A lot of people know you in your circle. And the, the theory that I'm applying to Zuck also applies to talk. <laughs> and it's, it's really important to contemplate, will people still know you in the same way? Or are you using the earring these days to hide and, right. not, and not be the next version of you? Right. Maybe it served a purpose. So there's a lot of stuff to, you know, I'm 
asking the questions it's, this isn't the right place to really right. you know hash it out with answers but yeah. at least at least for your benefit jack and for everyone who's you know all you know 30 of us or so who are in the room still chugging along listening here i think that it it's really important to think that those are the types of thoughtful questions that are honoring and help you evaluate and make really good sound decisions so that you can be more confident in knowing, hey, this is who I be and this is who I'm going to be and this is this is what my path forward is. And it stylistically, these things are important, but they also then become important from things that Joy and I were talking about with respect to your cognitive ability and how you want to show up for people and what kind of fight do you need to bring for people that you're representing and how do you need to be when you're with them because you're not fighting against them you know how do you want to show up and be you know in the presence of women who you're representing do what do they need from you and sometimes the audience is very individuated and one woman needs a different piece of your strength another woman needs you to kind of be a little softer in your approach when you're around her because that is safety for her mm -hmm. and maybe she's feeling threatened in some other ways and you know it all of this stuff just goes on and on and on and it's also why it's important to have a, a varied wardrobe that helps you be exactly who you need to be while also knowing your audience and customizing a look that is authentic to you, mm -hmm. but, you know, also really serves them and what they need to get out of their meetings with you and, and when you go fight for them. So lots of stuff to think about. Very wise. Helpful. Yes. Very wise. Thank you so much for the insight, Joseph. To be continued. Thank you. Love that. Thank, Thank you for coming up, Jack, yeah. and for Thank attending today. Yeah, You're welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, I'm blown away by your attention today, and really appreciate it because we've uh, we've gone on over an hour. I thought we would just have a few minutes of QA, and we have had more time for QA than my little presentation, even. So I like that because talking with you. And, and sharing insights that are relevant are, are what this is truly all about. Thank you all for wanting to come up and talk. Pernilla, I'm trying to bring you up to stage. Hello. Do you hear me? Yeah, hi. Hi, Joseph. So nice to listen to you today. A pleasure. We can all listen to you for a moment. What have you got yeah. in mind? No, I was actually, after Jack was talking, it was really, really interesting. I was thinking about, because I've been working as a principal for many, many years. I don't do that anymore. Now I am a consultant in leadership development. But anyway, for many years, I worked as a, as the principal of a, of a school. And I was thinking that sometimes, because my normal outfit would actually be like a jacket or something like that, a bit, a bit more formal. But sometimes when I had to have these special conversations with young students and their parents, I really needed to think before, who am I meeting today? And sometimes I actually needed to dress down to be able to open the channel for communication so sometimes i needed to wear like a jam jeans jacket or something instead or well nothing nothing formal anyways and that was that was to open the door because if i was too formally dressed it would be awkward for them if they were not coming from this i mean if they if they were not coming from the school environment or, or any other environment because you know we're just people meeting people and sometimes I really needed to yeah to actually dress down to be able to meet them to to create a, a safe space how do you what do you think about that sometimes you absolutely have to do that 
meeting your audience is important. And yet when you're a person of authority, it's also important to still show that. So for example, perhaps you didn't wear a more tailored jacket, but you wore a jeans jacket and a jeans jacket could still have a collar on it as opposed to a full lapel of a sport coat or a suit coat. And those types of things where you are wearing a layer or where you are wearing a collar or a lapel is a soft way of showing authority. It's not like putting a t-shirt on that says, you know, white t-shirt in black lettering that says, I am the authority. <laughs> and that, you know, you're trying to intimidate people. What you're really doing is you're showing people non-verbally with, with apparel messaging that is deeply encoded in our culture around the world now that lapels and collars mean authority. So even if, let's just say that you wore no jacket at all, okay? Let's just say, so no, no suit coat, no sport coat, no jeans jacket. And the choices were blouse or a t-shirt. The blouse wins because the blouse has a collar and a collar still has a piece of authority that a t-shirt would not ever have. So, and then there are other things that you can also do without overly showing off your decolletage or your breasts, you, you can, have an appropriate amount of openness in your collar being open and unbuttoned to a certain point that also shows non-verbally I'm open. Too much undone sh says conveys I'm available and, and in a different kind of a way, right? But when you at least show a little bit of openness at the neck, it, it tells people non-verbally a message of, I am open. And when you're wearing also the right kinds of colors in conjunction with everything else, you can elicit more listening from your perspective and can en engage the people that you're meeting with in, I really want to hear from you. So a, a good trick for this, for example, I love to talk about grays and charcoals. If there's a gray or a charcoal that you could wear that would look flattering on you, sometimes this does not work and then we have to think about some other color because grays are not for everybody, honestly. But if it is, putting on something gray, even if it's a gray silk charmeuse blouse, let's just say, where there's now no jacket at all, you are, I'm gonna break this down, gray silk charmeuse blouse. It's gonna have a collar, so it's got some soft authority. The gray sends a psychological message to the wearer, I'm gonna shut up and listen. The silk charmeuse is a material that is soft and has more of a, a gentle quality to it that the onlooker can actually look at you and, and, and see your soft qualities if they actually put their hand on your on your forearm just to just to touch your your forearm and to feel the silk charmeuse fabric they would feel the softness that they're actually connecting to with their eyes so when you do put all of these disparate things together it's one garment it's not even the whole ensemble but it's the garment that is closest to your face let's say and we haven't even talked about accessories like a, would you wear a necklace or earrings or eyeglasses that could all, when done well, could enhance what we're talking about and when not done well, could detract from the whole thing. When you put all these pieces together, you can actually telegraph to people, I, I am open to hearing from you. That is what the nonverbal message is without you ever having to say, I'm really open to hearing from you. I'm proving it with my nonverbal communication with my image, but that is exactly what you're telegraphing to people. And with your demeanor and behavior and your consultative therapeutic ways that you are, Pernilla, then when you put all of these pieces together, it it's automatic. Somebody absolutely sees it about you. 
And it comes back to you feeling confident in yourself and being at ease with yourself that you know what you're doing and how you're showing up. You're showing credibility to people because you are showing up in your power and you're at ease with your power and you look like an authority, but you don't look like a hard ass. So you're approachable. And, you know, in the end, that enhances your reputation because the parents and the students in this type of a scenario can both walk away and think, wow, that was a really good meeting. Pernilla was a good you know, she's a good teacher. She's a good facilitator. She's a good counselor. She really cares. And I know that because she really cares, she's going to do her best to help me. And all I have to do as the student or the parent is, you know, participate in this dialogue in an ongoing way, because one counselor meeting is not, you know, doesn't, doesn't complete whatever work, you know, brought you to the meeting with each other to begin with. Right. So, it's an ongoing dialogue. And then you have to keep showing up that way. That's a, a lesson for everybody who's listening is you then, then you have to, then you have to continue to show up the continuance of showing up this way, the constancy and the consistency of showing up helps brand you. And that branding of you is what your reputation is, is all about. Whew. How's that for an answer, Pernilla? That's a wow. <laughs> now I'm so fascinated that there are so many things to, that you can really, that you can read in, which I, I don't, but I, I, I get it when you say them. It's like, yeah, I like this a lot and I'm fascinated. I'm, it's interesting and you're very inspiring. So thank you so much. Oh, that's my pleasure. It's so what, what a wonderful thing to hear. I, I appreciate that reflection so much. Beautiful. I think it's time to say thank you very much for coming. Thank you all so much for being here today and for sharing some love with me. I love you all for being here unconditionally. And thank you all so much. I really enjoyed the room with you. Have a great day, everyone.